Hey, New Jersey Governor Phil Murphy here. Welcome and thank you so much for joining us this evening for a special event hosted by the Democratic Governors Association of which I am proud to serve as chair. I wanna turn the clock back to 2018, uh, which was an extraordinary exciting year as we know for the Democratic Party. Uh, across the country, voters turned up to push back against all of the harmful agenda of the Trump administration. And it's that year we saw Democrats swept into office up and down the ballot. And at the crest of that blue wave were Democratic governors. 2018 marked the election or re-election of 16 Democratic governors, including six incredible woman governors. Kansas Governor Laura Kelly, New Mexico Governor Michelle Lujan Grisham, Maine Governor Janet Mills, Michigan Governor Gretchen Whitmer, Oregon Governor Kate Brown, and Rhode Island Governor, and the, my predecessor as chair of the DGA, Governor Gina Raimondo. And we're lucky, incredibly lucky, to have all of those governors with us tonight. tonight tonight's conversation, by the way, will be moderated by Gina Raimondo. We'll cover the experiences these six governors have had since taking office the challenges they've faced and how their effective, compassionate, and collaborative leadership is building a new future for our country and for our party. There is no question that there is a dearth of women in leadership in every facet of our country, and the Democratic Governors Association is committed to changing that. We were proud to help elect Governor Kelly, Governor Mills, Governor Whitmer, Governor Lujan Grisham, and to help reelect Governors Brown and Raimondo. Their victories, by the way, were the first victories helped in part by the DGA's Women Governor Fund. Now we wanna build on this success. Guess what? Uh, we've got an extraordinary candidate in Missouri, State Auditor Nicole Galloway, uh, the only, by the way, woman statewide elected official in the Show Me State, and she's got a real shot to defeat GOP Governor Mike Parson, but she can't do it alone. She needs our support. So sit back and enjoy hearing directly from our six great extraordinary women governors about how they're leading their states and then join us in, keep, in helping us to keep winning and fighting for progress. So make sure you make note of this. Join us by texting WINNING, all caps, to 30201. That's WINNING to 30201 and help us win some more or you can go to demgovswin.com, demgovswin.com. Either way, we need your help. We deeply appreciate your help, and together we will go on to victory. Now, I'll, with that, I'll hand things over to my dear friend and extraordinary leader, the governor of the great state of Rhode Island, Gina Raimondo. Uh, good evening, and thank you, Governor Murphy, for that introduction. It's always good to be with you. I am so honored and excited, actually, to be moder moderating this panel with some of my fellow female Democratic governors. Uh, good evening, ladies. It's fabulous to be with all of you. For a long time, uh, it was just Governor Brown and I. There were two of us, and we were lonely. So we are thrilled now to be joined by Governor Mills and Governor Kelly, Governor Whitmere and Governor Lujan Grisham. It's uh, wonderful that we have tripled and I think we can all agree that we need even more female governors and more female democratic governors. Um, I will say, I can say this about each and every one of you, you won't say it about yourselves because you're too modest. I think you're all fantastic governors. I have looked up to each and every one of you as you have managed your states through the COVID crisis. I, I've called a number of you to ask for advice on different aspects of the crisis because you're all doing such a good job and the citizens of your state are very lucky to have you. So if people wanna know what do you get when you put a woman in the office, you get competence, compassion, and results. And so I'm thrilled to be with you all and I am uh, proud of each and every one of you. Now, um, we, this is an exciting time to be a woman. It's an ex a lot of talk these days about equity. Uh, we're not yet at a place of equity and equality in our country. 
but it's a historic moment for women in our country. More women are serving in Congress than at any time before in our country's history. We have a record, record number of female governors. It's exciting. I'll do a little Kate Brown on that one. <laughs> Uh, and in November, we're going to elect Kamala Harris as our first female vice president and first vice president of color. <laughs> yeah. Oh, yeah, that's going to be so sweet and so long overdue and so exciting. Anyway, everyone is excited to hear from you guys. So I'm going to do my best. This is a, a crowd. We could probably talk for three hours. We're going to try to condense all of our fun and, and wisdom into 45, 50 minutes. And it's just, it's a thrill for me to be with you guys, to see you. I wish we could be in person, but soon enough, we will be in person. So let's get going with our first question. Um, each of you has been a pathbreaker. Each one of you has has uh, been a first, you know, the, the f either first female governor, first Latina governor, um, you know, on and on. And so you're all pathbreakers in your own way. First female governor of Kansas. Thank God we have a Democratic governor of Kansas. So what I would ask you is, what's that like? What is that like? What does that mean to you to be a pathbreaker and a trailblazer uh, in your roles? So I'll go ahead and start with you, Governor Brown, uh, as, as one of the elder stateswomen in this group, and then we'll just pass it around the horn. Thanks, Governor Armando. I'm delighted to be part of this really impressive panel tonight. So I, I think what it means for the country and for our future is incredible. Um, I've had this saying that I've used, you can't be what you can't see. And I think it's really important for little girls, for young women to be able to see Senator Kamala Harris uh, as a VP candidate and hopefully as the uh, resident in the fall. It's really important for little girls to see women in these roles, in these leadership roles. And as the first LGBTQ governor elected in this country, I think it says to the entire LGBT community, you can be part of this. And it's so important that our elected leadership reflect the diversity of our communities because the public policy that we make when our leadership is more reflective of our communities is much more resilient and it's much more respectful to our communities. And that's how it ought to be. I agree. I agree. How about you, Michelle? You've had a number of firsts. Uh, well, I can agree more. I think there's another dynamic. You know, I was elected as the first Democratic Latina governor in the country, um, second Latina governor or Hispanic governor in New Mexico. And I think we're beginning to see that with the missteps, frankly, malpractice in the White House uh, and the lack of credibility uh, I think women are trusted. And so I'm seeing for the first time in certainly uh, around the country and the nation, people are talking to women about, I believe you on public health information. I believe you when you talk to me about the strategy. And uh, that's been really valuable for me in this role, uh, to be believed and to have that earnesty respected and embraced. And I'll tell you where it's translating. And for me, being, being in this spot today uh, is one of the highlights, is um, kids, grade school, mid school, high school, kids, girls, women, young women and adolescents interested in how this job works, uh, what's important to me, what are my values, what do they need to do, what, they can, uh, what value they can add. Uh, and uh, I've been in an elected office for a number of years. I haven't seen the number of girls and young women or school age uh, uh, students be so engrossed and engaged in what they can do for their city, their state, and their country. And being the first woman to participate in shifting where our country is headed, and that being credible and being earnest and truthful uh, and having courage that those are values that we now want to embrace in a younger population tells me truly we can heal this country. Mm -hmm. And seeing so many young women of color, now this is a state that's been producing elected women of color for more than 100 years, but it is, take, it is growing exponentially in our state, 
And we're likely to be the first state um, in the, Gina, in the uh, nation to have an all-female congressional delegation and very likely to have an all-woman uh, delegation, all women of color, which is frankly uh, historic. Wow. And I'm very excited to be in a position where New Mexico will be the first state in the country to really reflect the women who are leading in this state. That is so exciting. I didn't realize that. You know, I come from a state we've never had a female United States Senator in Rhode Island. And in our entire history, we've only had one Congresswoman decades ago, Republican, never a Democrat. So uh, obviously we have a lot of work to do and obviously I'm the first female governor. Um, so that's heartening, you know, to hear of that because I, I didn't realize that. So let's go to that woman from Michigan, the fabulous <laughs> Gretchen, Governor Gretchen Whitmer. It's great to see you. Uh, how does it feel for you? you you've, you've had a number of firsts, you're a path breaker, you, uh, you've had your hands full, obviously. Tell us what, what being the first means to you. Well, I think for all of us, being the first is one part of our story, but we're all determined not to be the last and to not just walk through a door, but to pull as many people through as we can. And I also think that one of the hallmarks of our leadership, uh, if I can be so bold as to speak on behalf of all of us, is that uh, not having had real representation or a seat at the table and having to fight for one makes us a lot more inclusive and thoughtful and intentional about ensuring that there are seats at the table for others who, you know, historically haven't had them. So when you look at our administrations, they look very different. My administration, we are over 65% women. Not because I said we're, that's what we're going to do, just because we were intentional about leveling the barriers that traditionally would keep women and, and candidates of color or LGBT community out of ap the application process or out yeah, of the- explain your success. The vetting. Yeah, and, and I do think so. When you know, we were one of the first states to recognize the incredible um, disparate impact that COVID had on communities of color. And I credit my chief medical executive, who is a, an African-American woman ER doc, who is also our chief medical executive, who was looking at the data and said, we got to report this. We've got to broadcast this. We've got to do outreach to communities of color. And so I think that um, having empowered seats at the table and keeping that door open and pulling more people through is something that is unique to the leadership of the women on the screen right now, um, as it is to women leaders all around the globe. And I think that's also why um, when you look at nations that have really battled COVID, oftentimes they're led by women. And it's, it's, not, a, it's not just a coincidence. Yeah, no, I agree. Um, one last one on this. I want to take a second to go to Governor Kelly because uh, obviously not only is it a very big deal to have a Democratic governor in Kansas, but I understand it with you at the helm, first female governor, uh, you have a woman at the helm of all three branches of government in Kansas now, which I think is exciting. So tell us a little bit about that. Well, let me first correct something. I am not the first uh, female governor uh, of the state of Kansas. Kathleen Sebelius would kill me. Uh, if yeah. I, uh, and she wasn't either. I'm actually the third uh, Irish Catholic Democrat female governor of, of the state of Kansas. Uh, so with that, but it's true at this particular stage uh, in Kansas history, uh, we have obviously a woman in the governor's office. Uh, we have a woman uh, chief justice of our Supreme Court. Uh, and we have a woman Senate president uh, who is outgoing uh, and will be replaced and hopefully by another woman. Uh, so yeah, that, that's a remarkable accomplishment, but sort of goes with Kansas history. Uh, you know, Kansas has was one of the very first states to recognize the value of women in elected positions. In fact, I think we elected the first mayor uh, in before women even had the right to vote. Uh, we were electing uh, folks to local uh, positions of power. So uh, we're, we're proud of that in Kansas uh, and we're continuing uh, that in Kansas. I think though, I the thing that I probably bring to the table during this time, and particularly you know, now that we're in this pandemic, 
I was elected, I believe, because Kansas was broken uh, and people turned to a woman to fix it. Uh, you know, we, we were, you know, coming out of the post Brownback era uh, where our entire uh, state had been decimated, uh, really drilled down to the core, ripped apart. And I believe that uh, in addition to having had a, an opponent that people were scared to death of, I think it was also the fact that, that people really do often turn to women uh, when there are times of trouble uh, and things need to be fixed. And we see that in our school districts with our PTAs and all sorts of other places where women, when there are problems, move in, take over and fix the problem. And I think that's uh, why people elected me. And I think that's worked out very well now that we got into the pandemic where we have both a healthcare crisis. And I think people tend to trust women a lot when it comes to healthcare kinds of issues and caretaking issues, which we need to do a lot of during this time, but also the economics. You know, uh, I think folks recognize, I, I know with me particularly, but I believe with women, they trust us more on the economic issue. They know that we're there for everybody. Not, It's not something for us. We're not trying to pat our own pockets, uh, you know, or you know, push up our buddies. Uh, we're really there uh, to make life better for everybody concerned. So I think, I think that's why, uh, you know, it's important that we've got a woman governor in Kansas right now. That is so well said. Uh, I'm sure Janet Mills would agree, as she's been picking up the pieces from Governor LePage. Uh, and and I, when I ran for office, Rhode Island had the highest unemployment rate in the country. And it was 2014, way after the recession was over in most places. And certainly our neighbor to the north, the Massachusetts, their economy was humming along. And uh, in fact, I was the first Democrat elected in more than uh, two decades. So after 20 some odd years of Republican mess making, which led us to the highest unemployment in the country, uh, I, I think you're right, Laura. I think part of the reason people elected me was it was broken and there was a trust factor that I could fix it. And I know Governor Mills, my God, did you have your hands full of mess when you took over from Governor LePage? I mean, absolutely. Um, I don't know if you want to touch on that, but that was a, a huge mess that he left you. Thanks, Gina. And like Laura, I uh, replaced a governor of eight years who was a Tea Party Republican who had done his, done his darndest to undermine our public education system, undermine our public health infrastructure, undermine um, health care in general, and, uh, and denigrate the, the climate change initiatives that we all wanted to take. In fact, he... Um, he joined the uh, alliance that would have supported offshore drilling for oil and gas off the coast of Maine, the pristine, beautiful coast of Maine. So the first thing I did, and thank God I had one really good year behind under my belt before the pandemic hit, but we were able to expand Medicaid. So now tens of thousands of more people in Maine have health care during a pandemic who would otherwise have gone without and probably lost their lives and now we have public education, more money towards public education at the very time when we need it to open up those doors to children and, and expand broadband. We have a children's cabinet that we, we uh, reinstituted. We, we imposed um, increased minimum pay for teachers, public school teachers. We developed an opioid response and hired an opioid response director something that had been so neglected for eight years, the devastating effects of the opioid epidemic and substance use disorder. We, we, do, we enacted paid leave, the most progressive paid leave provision in the United States. We got that done uh, and we joined the US Climate Alliance, thank God, and we put money towards heat pumps and broadband and electric vehicles and solar and offshore wind to expand our economy. This is the time we need it more than ever. We got that, it, all those initiatives commenced last year, and then the pandemic hit. I'm also very proud. First, I want to thank the Dem Democratic Governors Association, who really put their uh, strength and muscle behind my election two years ago. Thank you so much for everything you did to help me, Laura, and others get elected two years ago. And thank God we're here now. So we, um, you know, 
uh, and I've relied so much on the camaraderie and the communications with other women governors, those who joined this panel today. Uh, and it's been a blessing to have your back to have and you to have my back during these extraordinary times. We are, are still rebuilding our public health system. I'm also proud that I have a cabinet, cabinet of 15 people, very professional, uh, wonderful people, all of them. Eight of the 15 are women, uh, and soon to be nine out of 15. We're drinking maple syrup today, main maple syrup, um, and, and Poland Spring Water, product placement, yes. Um, we go together. No, that's just shameless. You're doing very well, and then that was just a shameless. That was a shame. So there's a lot of people watching this, young women who might be watching this, or, or maybe not, you know, women who have never run for office, who are inspired by you guys and listening to your story, seeing uh, that it's a moment for women, and they're thinking, should I run? Now, of course, whenever they ask me, I say, absolutely. And, and by the way, as I listen to you, I think, God, if we had more women running this country, <laughs> we would be in much better shape. Um, but then the question that is often asked, so they'll ask us, should we run? We would say yes. But then they say, I'm worried about campaigning. There's so much sexism on the campaign trail. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I hear it a lot. I'm sure you hear it a lot. People are, you know, afraid a little bit or reluctant to put themselves out there. Um, and I think it's a, clearly it's a fact to say there's a double standard. Clearly it's a fact to say it will be difficult. So I want to ask each one of you, how has campaigning been different, um, harder or easier as a woman? And what's it like? And what's the advice that you would give to women watching this convention, thinking they want to run? What would you want them to know before they do their first campaign? So whoever wants to jump, jump in first, go ahead. Well, I'll say put your best foot forward. Don't be shy. Generally takes women more, you know, more times being asked than it does men. Men seem to jump at the chance. Women are more hesitant, and we got to get over that. You know, what's the worst that can happen? You might lose an election. You might not win the first time, but you will win ultimately. Talk to any of us about how we campaigned and uh, what ones we, we won, what ones we didn't win, um, and how we got out there. I think you have to be so honest. The people want authenticity. They want somebody who's going to be totally blunt with them, uh, honest with them people with integrity and credibility, and women have that a lot more than you think. Mm -hmm. I would also say, watch the Hillary Clinton Hulu special. You know, that was, I think, a, a wonderful education. Having run a number of campaigns for the last 20 years, um, to, to watch the ups and downs and the heartbreak and the challenges, you know, it was heartbreaking and it, and it, it was, it gave me more determination. And I think that that's something that um, is, is helpful. It's, it's very real. And the best advice I got throughout my campaign, there were all these different guys thinking about jumping in and I had already jumped in and I was chatting with another woman and I said, you know, what if someone so gets in? She goes, you can't control it. All you can control is what you do. So just work your tail off and they're going to see it and they're not going to jump in. And she was right. And so we kept the blinders on, did our, you know, program. We worked, uh, we focused and see, and, and this is another thing women do is we say we, when we mean I, but um, it was, it, that was, that was such good advice because everyone's going to have an opinion. Everyone's going to um, think they know better, but what you can't control is how you work, how you um, conduct your campaign, how you live your values, and how you show up. And so show up as you every single day was the best advice I got. I love that. Show up as you every single day. Yeah. But and I, oh, go ahead, Tina. Ask I was another say, but, you know, I think um, if anyone feels comfortable talking about it, it is harder as a woman. You will face sexism and a double standard on the campaign trail. So... Uh, you know, talk about that for you guys. What's it been like? How have you overcome it? I'm sorry, Michelle, I didn't mean to interrupt. Well, no, it's it, uh, part of this, I think, has to be a call to action. You know, women, we, we really do. You know, I'm with 
that woman in Michigan. We got to have each other's back. And I do think this is an extraordinary opportunity for us to be doing that and messaging uh, with Senator Harris on the ticket, right? It's the bridge to attack sexism head on. In my campaign, I had two men I was running against in the primary. And they kept their, their theme, the message is, nobody wants two women in a row as governor. <laughs> you never say that about your uh, male Men? Ever. And even so, you know, they, they would start their attack with my outfit, my makeup, my hair, my stature. It was all personal characteristics because uh, they knew they were trying to distract people from I'm more qualified than anyone I'm running against. I have a better track record than anybody I'm running against. I'm more effective. I get things done. Uh, they don't want to talk about any of that. So what, they, what, what they're going to continue to do. And women who are engaged in negative social media efforts, same issue, right? They go to sexism. And the only way that we deal with that, and it will be hard on your campaign. Um, I'd love to tell everyone who's watching this that, in fact, I, I did a, a, a speech for Emerge and some other, you know, uh, pro-choice Democratic women organizations that engage in training and support so more women will run or work on campaigns. And they're incredibly successful in New Mexico. But if you decide to run and you're working and you have a family, let me assure you, this will be the most hideous, hateful, difficult, hurtful environment you will ever put yourself in your whole life. And somehow it will be worth it. If the people who will stand with you are remarkable, the challenges that you will overcome that you didn't think you had the strength to overcome, you will. It will be a reckoning and a recognition of all the reasons that you want to make a difference. That's the power. Uh, and I think this is an opportunity for not just each of us, but every woman in America to stand solidly and every one of our men, our supporters, our workers, our partners, we must take a stand against sexism. And let's just put it to bed once and for all. Yeah, amen to that. Kate, I saw you wanting to jump in. Yes, and I, I do think the challenges for a woman of color are even uh, more uh, egregious. So women, you have both the layers of racism and sexism uh, on the campaign trail. When I ran in 2008, I had a Democratic uh, woman say to me, I was in a contested, hotly contested primary for Secretary of State. And she said to me, I'm voting for the guy because he has a family to support. I'm like, seriously? So I, I think for women candidates, I think there's a couple of things that are key. I tell girls, young women, um, to follow Find what gets you up in the morning. I'm making a heart. Find what gets you up in the morning and go after it. Um, I think women tend to run because we want to get something done. Um, I call it GSD, get stuff done. And so it's really important to find your passion and follow that. Um, I also think it's really important. You're going to have to work hard, prepare, prepare, prepare. And this is where organizations like Emily's List, the Democratic Governors Association are absolutely instrumental. I, um, I am a lawyer, but I didn't uh, do any debate until my campaigns for governor. And it was a little late in the game and I encourage young people to learn good debating and good public speaking skills. But DGA, Democratic Governors Association, came in and assisted me in my election in 16 and my election in 18. And we spent resources. I got a couch. I spent a lot of time prepping. <laughs> I laughed. My opponent laughed. He said, oh, he didn't need to do that. Guess what? <laughs> After the first debate, he hired a coach and he made sure he was prepared. Nice. And obviously I won. So <laughs> prepare, prepare, prepare. I love that. I think both of you are saying a similar thing. You know, Michelle was saying it's going to be hard. Know that but it's worth it. Not for your own power and glory, as you were saying, not power, but to pursue what you care about. Pursue, you know, you want to help people, whatever it might be, healthcare, the economy, education, go at it because you will make people's lives better. Governor Brown said something I want to um, ask you folks to pick up on. 
uh, you said it's even harder for women of color, which is undoubtedly true. And of course, Senator Kamala Harris, who's going to be the next vice president of the United States of America, uh, is going to have a tough time, I, I think, in the campaign because she, you know, for the reasons we're talking about. So I wonder, Governor Kelly or Governor Mills, what do you, what do you think some of the challenges will be that she will have that the average voter at home might not realize, but that we know instinctively and by experience, it's just harder to be a woman, particularly as an executive. I have found that myself, you know, and to be a woman of color, first ever vice president, it's not, this is not going to be easy at every step for her. So uh, how do you think of those challenges? Let me, uh, let me answer first, if I may. And that is, I, I know Kamala Harris from being attorney general with her. She has executive experience and it's something she can brag about. She ran a large office, statewide office, the office of the attorney general. Um, and I think one thing she'll keep in mind and others should keep in mind is when you're attacked, whether it's by bots and uh, trolls on, on social media or otherwise, there'll be plenty of that. Don't respond and keep your sense of humor. She's level-headed, she's gutsy, and she's got a great sense of humor. And a lot of the stuff that you're gonna see and hear, you, people are gonna have to laugh off because sometimes that's the only way to deal with it. If you respond, you're giving that attack some credibility. I think she knows how to do that. She knows how to stay laser focused on the, the prize, which here is the White House and the Vice Presidency. Could not be a bigger time, a bigger year, a bigger prize for us to win back this year. Yeah, I'm, I'm not the least bit worried about Kamala during this race. Uh, I mean, I can't think of anybody better equipped uh, to deal with what's coming. She knows what's coming, and boy, she's good at responding to it. Uh, I think she will put everybody off balance. Uh, they'll be trying to do that to her, but I think she'll throw it right back at them, uh, and they'll get on the defensive, and, and she will just keep moving forward. I have absolutely all the confidence in the world that she is the right person at the right time uh, to, to be there uh, representing not only women and people of color, uh, but all uh, Americans. She, she just has everything, I think she has everything that it's going to take to be a terrific running mate uh, for Joe Biden. I think she compliments him uh, in extraordinary ways. Uh, and I think she exudes confidence uh, in her in and of herself. You know, I, I don't think there's going to be anybody except those who have to do that for a living who, who don't believe that she truly is uh, ready to be just a heartbeat away from the presidency. I, I'm, I'm just thrilled uh, that she's there. Uh, and I'm really looking forward to her uh, tackling uh, all of the challenges that will come through and, and coming out on top of all of it. Yeah. But we're seeing yeah. Women of color, right? People of color, not real Americans, right? This is where uh, that horrible divide occurs. Uh, you're, or for me, uh, my family's been in New Mexico for 12 plus generations, the 400 years. It's, well, you're going to be soft on immigration and you're going to be, you don't care about everybody, you don't care about us. These horrible, divisive, negative, angry, racist efforts to try to continue to divide the country. Now, she's ready for that, of course, but we're seeing that play out already. And I think it's important for us to make sure we don't give that ridiculousness and hateful rhetoric any room in this election, but to recognize it is out there. And the other side is going to continue to push that. And it means that we have a greater responsibility, all of us, to make sure that we are American. We embody the best values of Americans and American families and working families. And Kamala Harris, Senator Harris, is is that in spades, and we need to tell our story so all the women of color who are elected all across the country ought to be sharing their own personal stories of success and meaningful participation uh, in this country and in their communities. And I think that is a way that we can productively combat uh, the, the, the racist rhetoric that we know the other side is already promoting, and it's been a go-to place for them, for all people of color in every election for the last decade. Uh, and again, like sexism, we have an opportunity to do everything about it. And uh, I know I intend to do that. 
Yeah, I think that's exactly right. I mean, I agree with all of you. I think she's fantastic, prepared, has executive experience, confident. But I think um, Governor Lujan Grisham's right. I think it's going to be ugly. There'll be that us versus them, you know, the otherness that we see is part of our politics today. Uh, I think we should get ready for it and each and every one of us stand up against it. Call it out when we see it and stand up against it. Call it out when we see it. I totally agree. I think one of the things that we've seen in recent years is women being unafraid to to shed all the, you know, traditional requirements, right? You had to smile perfectly and not offend anyone. And you know what? We're being rewarded for showing up as we are. We're people, we're connecting because people see that it's real and it's genuine. When I see Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez take on a bully on the floor of the House of Representatives, when I see, you know, I, I, I told, Senator Harris called me the other day and I said, I can't wait until the debate. I'll be eating my popcorn. <laughs> but because when you show up as you are, when you call it out, you disarm the bully. Sometimes that's that's the, the most important thing. And that's why when she was announced, I wanted to be joining the hashtag, we have her back. No matter who she was, we were all going to do that. And I think it's important that we not let this, you know, efforts to divide us and to minimize us take any ground. We have to take it on when it happens and we have to be blunt. And sometimes we have to, um, you know, get out of our safety zone because not just we are counting on it, but my daughters are counting on it. And all of the generations that are coming up, um, male and female, or however they identify, everyone's watching and everyone needs to see themselves in this. And I think that's why this moment is so important. And that's why I'm so excited about this ticket. Yeah, I couldn't agree. Yeah. With, as you know, each of you know, we've all been out there sometimes it's easier for someone else to call it out so you know when we see her you know something racist something sexist a slight it's on us to call it out uh as we would do for each other because sometimes it's obviously easier to do that for someone else and i intend to do that uh for every woman out there, frankly, who, who, you know, you guys, but obviously also Senator Harris, this one is just too important and it will be there. I'm sorry, Kate, you were gonna say something. Uh, I, add in, I think it's so critically important um, that Senator Harris know that she has an army of support behind her, right. that we have her back. But I also want Americans to realize that each one of us can make a difference. It's true during the pandemic, but it is also true during this election cycle. I ran for the legislature the first time in 1992. I won my primary by literally seven votes. This many years later, people come up to me, though now they call me governor. Governor Brown, I was your seventh vote. I was the reason that you won. And the power of that vote and the importance of making sure that every voice is heard and that every vote is counted is so key and we're all this that this election is more important than ever but i think we would all agree with all of our vast experiences that this election is so critically important for the future not only the country for the future of democracy and so it's so important that every person get out there and vote. In Oregon, we vote by mail. We want to make it convenient and safe and non-hackable. Uh, but uh, I know a number of states are working on uh, ensuring that every eligible American can exercise this fundamental right. Absolutely. Thank you for saying that, Governor Brown. It's so important. And obviously, the guy in the White House does not want every vote counted. Uh, he so it's more important than ever that we in our positions as governors protect the ballot in our states. And I know you, of course, Kate, have been a leader on this issue for years and we're all proud of your leadership. Um, so I wanna switch gears a little bit. I, I don't wanna run out of time, but you're all governors in the middle of a pandemic. We've all had 
sleepless nights over the past six months and ups and downs. So tell me about your worst day in the past six months. Either worst day, toughest decision. <laughs> me, me. Yeah, you can go first. Yes. Yeah. Um, I'll just say I, a few days stick out. I remember being on a call with the nation's governors in the White House, and Detroit's numbers were increasing so quickly. We were going into a weekend where we had one shift worth of PPE. And the president told us all, you know, essentially, I'm not a shipping clerk, you're on your own. And it, it was like that in that moment where I realized we had to build a global procurement office in our state emergency operations center. And, 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 and just the magnitude of what we weren't gonna be able to count on from the federal government and how quickly we had to move because Michigan was really early um, compared to a, a lot of the nation. Obviously Washington state first, but then New York and Michigan and Louisiana were heating up fast. Um, another was, you know, when the tweets started coming and, the, and the, the president singled me out, it changed my whole dynamic here in Michigan. Prior to that, we'd had uh, bipartisan support out of my legislature for my executive orders. As soon as he did that, they wouldn't extend the state of emergency. They started suing me. They're now collecting signatures to take my powers away. I mean, it's just been ugly since then. I had people show up on the front lawn of the the residents with automatic rifles and at the Capitol, and you all saw the pictures. Um, but I, I think the hardest day when, when I was like, is this for real, um, was when we had two floods, two dams collapse in Midland, Michigan. In the midst of all of this, we had to evacuate 10,000 people in the middle of the night while in the midst of a global pandemic. And so, you know, we, you add on the, the righteous, demonstrations around race in America right now. And we have been in a normal day, you would devote all of your energy to one of these crises. And yet we're navigating all of them. And I know that's not unique to Michigan, you're all doing it too. But uh, there certainly there's no handbook for this moment. And that's why to a lot of to your opening remarks, Gina, talking to my fellow governors has helped give me perspective and I'm so grateful for that. Yeah. We've been very proud of you, watching you. I'm sorry you've had to deal with that. <laughs> um, it's crazy. I think we pro I know I've had protesters at my house on numerous occasions. It's, it's tough. It has it's been tough, really but... surreal to have all of those attacks. And I do think they're heightened. I'm not saying that, frankly, all governors in this context are being attacked in any number of ways that really interfere with the fact that you are managing a crisis. But for me, the toughest day, uh, everything that Gretchen is talking about, right? Uh, civil unrest, other protesters about every uh, order, one of our business groups uh, uh, organizing with a uh, civil militia who then was basically calling for my execution uh, and then I'm making a call to the parents of an eight-year-old who took his own life and in his note talked about his own isolation during the pandemic and wanting everyone to do more and these parents feeling like they just had no option to protect him from a deadly virus and their family and not having access to all of the other sports and summer activities and school. I, I don't think enough people realize about how we, I know how hard it is for every single family who's still in a, in a stay at home, under a stay at home order, for every business that is lost, that's been in the hands of their families for generations, uh, all of it, it is really unprecedented. And I do think, uh, quite frankly, given that now we've got the White House sort of pushing out that you're, that the, when you had a bipartisan environment that you should be sued and attacked and protested and that it's okay. We literally have a Republican county commission or who continues to call for, and I quote, the execution of every Democrat in the state. Unlawful, hateful, angry. But I have a responsibility to keep everybody safe, to keep the economy moving to the highest degree that I can, to make sure that we're safely educating every population, that public safety is doing its job while recognizing that racism is a public health issue. We have to do all of it. And then you have to make those calls. There's not a one of us today 
who hasn't had to talk to a family grieving, whether it's a natural disaster or a public safety incident or something directly related to COVID. It's untenable. And I wanted to thank every single one of you for standing up every single day, protecting every single constituent while knowing what's at stake and that you have no idea when you get up in the morning what they're going to throw at you. And yet, being the shortest governor in the country, we have all stood incredibly tall. I'm pretty short too, Michelle. I think Kate and I give you a little competition for that title. Yeah. Oh, you're yeah. over five foot. I, you guys I think I'm taller than both of you by far. <laughs> Yeah, if I could, if I could jump in here, um, when I was listening to Gretchen talk about uh, them suing her and taking away her powers, whatever, all of that has happened here, uh, you know, and uh, I had to enter into a compromise with the legislature uh, so that we could continue to help our counties. Uh, if I had not agreed uh, to give up some power, uh, we would have had to stop assisting counties uh, right in the middle of, of the worst of it. So uh, I've been there, done that. Um, Last week, two weeks ago, uh, I had a speaker of the House uh, show up at a state finance council after having been hospitalized with COVID. He did not reveal that he had been exposed and hospitalized to the Democrats, including me. He told his caucus uh, after the fact, but he just showed up at a committee meeting, uh, no mask, initially had a mask, took it off, uh, and did not reveal anything. This obviously came out later. Uh, and, and the betrayal that I felt, the, the real sense of, you know, just how partisan can we be here that, that you would do that uh, just because I'm a Democrat. Uh, that, that was really hurtful uh, and, and I won't forget it. Uh, but I think the, the hardest part uh, for me was when I had to shut down the schools. Uh, and shut them down for good for the school year. And obviously we're, we're sort of reopening uh, as we go forward here, but that was really hard just because uh, again, you know, that empathy that women have, you know, I, I've been a mother of school age children, a working parent. Uh, I know the kind of hardship uh, and angst that that created for all of our families across the state of Kansas and having to do that, knowing that there was no choice uh, but to shut those buildings down uh, to protect the health, but recognizing that I was creating lots of other issues uh, for families was truly the hardest thing uh, that I've had to do. Yeah, I can imagine. So, so Gina, um, in Oregon, we, we've done relatively well, and I think in part because Oregonians are considerate and of their neighbors and their community. You know, that's true in all of the state. Um, and I've worked really hard to make decisions based on science and data, like all of you. And I am certainly putting the health and safety of Oregonians at the top of my priorities in terms of making decisions. But I recall, and I think many of you were on conversation with the president shortly after the unfortunate killing of George Floyd in Minneapolis where the president encouraged us to, quote, dominate the streets and put our National Guard out on the streets. We did have them come uh, several weeks later. Uh, Department of Homeland Security officers, Border Patrol, ICE, um, and they came here not to problem solve, not to provide public safety. They came for political theater and severely injured one young man uh, they broke a veteran. Uh, it was absolutely devastating. And I could not believe that I had to tell the President of the United States that this is a democracy, not a dictatorship. Fortunately, we were able to have some conversations with folks and uh, remove the federal officers from our streets. But I have to tell you the strife and the violence and the chaos is unbearable. And it will take a lot of healing and a lot of work to bring our communities back together again. And we have to be focusing, I think, on the pandemic, on the economic realities, and tackling the systemic racism that is impacting all of our communities, all of our lives. And that's where we can all be working together and where we should be working together. Yeah, I so felt for you, Kate, when that was happening. They were, 
agitators and escalators. And it was just, as you say, it'll take an awful lot of healing to uh, recover from that in your community. How about you, Janet? Worst day? Oh, tough gosh. Well, when we announced the first death from COVID, it was pretty emotional. Yeah. Um, we've had about 100, more than 120 deaths since then, but we've been able to keep the numbers low. There was also a massive explosion at one of our large paper mills, which um, had threatened to also devastate our economy. Fortunately, everybody was evacuated. Nobody was killed. Nobody was badly hurt. That, but that was terrifying for, on a lot of levels. Um, but when the president came to visit, after that notorious phone conference where he talked about taking back our streets, and I asked him not to come, and he sort of he took it as a double dare, only to come and further politicize the pandemic, call me a dictator when we've got the best numbers in the country, Vermont and Maine. Uh, I think we've done a pretty darn good job uh, keeping things, uh, keeping the virus at bay, despite his criticism. But uh, that was a pretty bad week. We were in the middle of the uh, demonstrations and protests of Black Lives Matter, et cetera, the pandemic, and then the, and the economy. And then the president decides to come visit. As you know, that's not always a welcome event. <laughs> yeah. No, I know. Well, it's like Governor Whitmer said, on any typical year, any one of these things, yeah. a natural disaster, a dam bursting, civil unrest, an explosion, shutting down the schools, any one of those is you know, a difficult thing to manage. Now doing all of it every day, all at once is, uh, more than a handful. And, you know, you know, my staff's getting tired every day, seven days a week. If the burn is real yeah. and you try to give folks a day here, a day there, but uh, it's a challenge and you're all nodding. And I know that's what we do as, as the chief executive, you have to put together the team, but then manage them and motivate them and nurture them. And my God, I am so proud of my team. The, the civil servants, the folks, the Department of Health, the National Guard, the first responders, everyone. I have never been prouder to be a public servant and to be surrounded by dedicated public servants, most of whom they'll get no recognition, no press, coming into work late at night, early on a Sunday, every day. And I know you're all nodding. I know you have the same experience, but uh, it's folks are tired but yet they're committed and that has inspired me that is what keeps me going uh because i see them going every day okay so as i predicted i thought we could talk forever and it's already been an hour and i'm getting the high sign to wrap this up i will say it's so nice to see you i'm can't wait until we can do this together i'd love to see you all and give you a, a real hug not just a virtual hug i'm, I'm proud of you i'm here for you uh, if I can ever help any one of you and um, just and keep we, it up, stay strong. Each of you stay strong and know you're doing a terrific job and, and your states are lucky to have you as the leaders during this time. Well, let's, uh, let's get together and elect the most qualified team ever to run for president. Exactly. I was just going to say that. So we have a historic, historic, historic election in front of us. Let us make Joe Biden our president and Senator Kamala Harris our vice president. I cannot wait to vote. I wish the election were tomorrow, uh, but we all have to make sure that we carry our states for them and because this, I can, there's never been a more important election in our lifetimes, that's for sure. And we ha we're very lucky to have them leading our ticket at the top of our ticket. So why don't we start um, with Gretchen, and then Michelle, Kate, Janet, and Laura, everyone give um, closing remarks or a final goodbye. I'll just say this. I feel incredibly lucky to be amongst this phenomenal group of leaders in America. I didn't say female leaders. I just said leaders in America. And um, I have been so enriched by these relationships. You've helped me make me a better governor. Um, and this is something, you know, we're in the midst of something like none of us has ever navigated before, but uh, so long as we stick together, we're going to get through it. Tough times don't last, but tough people do. And these are some of the toughest people in America on this screen. So thank you, ladies. And thank you, everyone who is tuning in. 
Thank you. Wow. Uh, Gretchen, I agree with you. I was going to do just a shout out to Gina. You know, I've been bragging uh, about you, Gina, and the fact that not just having the, the, the leadership skills to identify, we need to fix the way in which this country does contact tracing, but actually looking, right, at the different architectures for information technology, calling in the business sector, and just solving it by being in the room. Uh, this matters. Uh, leaders who want to be at the table and in the room, hands-on, solving problems, making a difference, it truly does create the kind of environment where we can turn this country around. I am uh, incredibly proud and honored to be with this group uh, of women and leaders, uh, democratic leaders in the country. Uh, I, uh, I believe unequivocally uh, that we're going to build back our nation, uh, uh, the vice president's statement, better than ever. And I feel really good he's got this group of governors who will have the tickets back to make sure that we put the country back together. Amen, and thank you. Kate? Sure. I think it's so important when the fabric of society is frayed, uh, uh, that foundation of our democracy remains strong, and uh, democracy is not a spectator sport. We need every single eligible American, every Democrat, uh, to cast their ballot early, soon, make it happen. Truly, the future of the country in your hands, and uh, you have to vote. So please do it. Uh, and if you could do it in a vote by mail, vote at home state, do it sooner rather than later, because we can ensure that this country is better for everyone and that we move forward together. And it's such an incredible honor to serve with these amazing group of women and the remainder of the Democratic governors. Thank you all. Let's keep the country moving forward. Laura? You know, I'd, I'd really like to talk to the young women uh, who I hope are watching all of this and tell them that you, if now is not the time for you to run for office, it might not be. You might not be in the right place uh, right now. Uh, but to every day, go to work, do your job, do it well, develop leadership skills, take on leadership roles, do what needs to be done. And then when time is right, be there to answer this call. You know, those of us on the screen right now, we fought really hard to get here. What we need is for you to follow this up so that everything that we've done and our foremothers have done doesn't go for naught that this really is a foundation that gets built upon, and that's all on you. I trust you to do it right. Well nice. said. Nice. Governor Mills, you have the last word. Oh, thank you. Oh, Gretchen, maybe. Um, listen, we have a lot of issues to talk about this year and every year. Issues uh, surrounding voting rights, uh, education, climate change and the environment, health care, prescription drugs, all those things are issues. But what we're fighting for more than anything else in this particular year, this particular presidential election is the truth because that's been the biggest loser this year in particular. Somebody at the top of our government who doesn't tell the truth, in fact, fabricates things every day. This is the horrible thing we're fighting in, in this election. And I'm so glad that we can support Joe Biden and Kamala Harris who has, both of whom have the guts, the gumption, the values, the character, and the integrity to win this election and to govern in a, in a professional a way that we can be so proud of. So let's make it a blue wave this November. Go team. Thank you all. Thank you. All right. We'll let you guys get back to work. Take care. Mwah. Thank you. Great Thank job. You. Thank, Thank you. Hi, great job. Good to see Thank you all. You. Great to Thank see you. Thank you all so much. Really appreciate you joining on Sunday. And uh, we'll send you the final cup before we put it up on uh, Wednesday. All right? Thank you. Take care. Stay out there. Thanks, everyone. Yes, All right. Stop it. Once they flew away, and then he